Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. Awesome. Um, this is Reimagining Exploration. Um, my name is Aja Miller, and I'm an assistant editor at Stranger's Guide. We're an award-winning publication that commissions stories from local writers and photographers to build authentic portraits of a place. Learn more about us and what we do at strangersguide.com or look for our global tickets spread around the festival. Today, you guys are in for a treat. I'm super, super excited to introduce Dr. Jill Tiefenthaler. As Chief Executive Officer at the National Geographic Society, Jill oversees the development and implementation of the Society's mission-driven work and programmatic agenda. She leads a global community of scientists, innovators, educators, and storytellers in a mission to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. Jill currently sits on the Society's Board of Trustees and the Board of National Geographic Partners. So give it up for Jill, and please turn your attention to the screens for a quick video. today. I love my job and that's exactly why what you just saw there. Um, I get to go home every day and tell my husband about what our explorers do, including repelling into an active volcano in the name of science. These are the kind of stories that inspire and motivate us, especially when the world has been largely shut down for the last two years. I began my tenure at, as CEO at National Geographic in August of 2020. You'll think about when that was, right in the middle of the pandemic. So I've largely been stuck in the seventh circle of Zoom for the last couple years. I've met both most of our global community um, virtually, so it's actually wonderfully refreshing to be with you all in person and tell you about Nat Geo. So when you think of Nat Geo, what's the first thing you think of? the yellow border, maybe the Afghan girl and her piercing green eyes on the 1985 cover. Or maybe this tender moment captured in 2018 when a wildlife ranger comforted Sudan, the last male northern white rhino on the planet, moments before he died. Or perhaps this amazing image of the rusted Titanic when it was discovered at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean a staggering two and a half miles below the surface. When we think of National Geographic, uh, many think of our stunning images, the iconic stories, um, and the yellow border. In my role, I meet people all the time who love the organization, and they tell me their Nat Geo stories. Many are about the important influence that the National Geographic magazine had on their childhoods. And that was the case for me. I grew up on a popcorn farm in Iowa, and as a little girl, I explored the world through the pages of the National Geographic magazine at my little tiny library at St. Bernard School. In fact, I was uh, in my school library when I first saw this image, King Tut's mask on the March 1977 cover. To that day, I still vividly remember what I felt like when I first laid eyes on this. It was magical a passport to an ancient dynasty, a visual journey of archeological discovery that ignited my imagination. The impact that National Geographic has on people is why it's such a tremendous honor to be part of this legacy of exploration and adventure. But I have to be honest, when I first received the call about being nominated for this role at National Geographic, I was shocked and a bit reluctant. I'd spent my entire career in higher education first as an economics professor, then a dean and provost, and then event in the last, most recently, as president of Colorado College, one of the nation's top liberal arts schools. I loved the life of the mind and had intended to stay in academia for my entire career. So my first thought when the headhunter called was, I'm not a scientist or an explorer. It's true, they do call economics, I'm an economist, the dismal science. Uh, and I am curious, but economists don't dive to the depths of the ocean to discover new species or climb the highest mountains to understand the impact of climate change. But I kept thinking, it's National Geographic. I have to explore this. 
And in the end, I was easily convinced. Why? It came down to two things. First, as a leader, I believe one of the greatest opportunities we have to really challenge ourselves to step outside our comfort zones, which this definitely did. And two, the legacy of National Geographic Society is so much richer than compelling images. There's a lot more to the story. It's a legacy deeply rooted in mission, using our incredible brand and platform as a global nonprofit to make a difference in the world. It's part of our DNA going back to our earliest days. So this image is a painting of our 33 founders. They were scientists, cartographers, lawyers, military officers, and financiers. They look like kind of a stuffy bunch here, but the reality is that most were young innovators and explorers. In fact, all but a handful were under 40, the youngest being 24. They came together 134 years ago in Washington, D.C., united by a passion for dauntless exploration and the advancement of knowledge. Together, they established the National Geographic Society. Within two years, the Society funded its first scientific expedition, led by one of our founders, explorer Israel Russell. Flanked by nine men and two dogs, Bud and Tweed, sadly not pictured here, they set out to survey and scale one of the highest peaks in North America, Mount St. Elias. The team extensively mapped the area's topography, geology, geography, providing a lens into the region's most isolated terrains. And that was long before the days of social media, so instead of tweeting or posting, they shared their findings in text. Fun fact, the magazine, as you see here, originally had a humble brown cover, and this particular issue circulated to about 400 members. But in the late 19th century, National Geographic was a kind of Google Earth, showing curious people the places they'd never been before. Israel's journey marked the first and the beginning of thousands of explorer-led National Geographic expeditions. The society has grown tremendously since that time, evolving with nimbleness in a changing world while staying true to our pursuit and celebration of exploration, scientific excellence, education, and unforgettable storytelling. Over the years, the Society has awarded more than 15,000 grants to explorers for their work across all seven continents, many to extraordinary individuals you probably heard of. Matthew Henson, among the first to reach the North Pole, the legendary Jane Goodall, filmmaker Jacques Cousteau, and oceanographer Bob Ballard, who discovered that Titanic. Today, the Society remains the home of the explorer, we have about 6,000 explorers around the globe, representing more than 140 countries. And we've made amazing progress in bringing the best and brightest from all backgrounds. We've reached gender parity, with half of our grants now going to women, plus more than 60% of our grants are awarded to non-US citizens conducting work worldwide. So who's an explorer today? Let's take a look. That was an explorer. If I was an explorer, I would wake up, put on my hijab, put on my gear. I would take my tools to investigate. I'd put on my spacesuit, and then I'd shoot off into the stars. If I was an explorer, I wouldn't care about getting dirty. I would take my findings back to the lab to build things, create new things. Being an explorer is all about understanding this world better to show the world a different way of seeing. To venture into uncharted territory. My name is Arthur Huang. Ana Reyes Morales. Dominique de Mille Correa Gonçalves. And this, this is what an explorer looks, looks like. Explorers are the heart and soul of National Geographic. And when I joined the society, I quickly realized that they had to play a critical role in our future. Our new strategic plan, NG Next, recognizes our rich history and takes the next step forward, charting a bold path, weaving diversity, equity, and inclusion into every aspect of our work, and setting a clear vision for drive, driving significant impact in the future. At every step of the way, we're guided by our mission. We use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. It's an audacious goal. So how do we actually do it? We advance knowledge and make important contributions to science, and we protect our planet 
through leading conservation programs with measurable and outsized impact. But we also have impact through illumination, both storytelling and education. As a longtime educator, I firmly believe that those are valuable in their own right, but at its best, illumination leads to protection, inspiring people to care and act on behalf of our planet and its people. And explorers hold the key to all of this. So I'm excited to share some examples of the explorers who are fulfilling our mission and advancing our theory of impact. And with the power of Nat Geo video, you're going to hear all about it directly from them. Explorer in Residence, Enrique Sala, leads our Pristine Seas program. Twelve years ago, Enrique left a career in academia because he felt that he was writing the obituary of the ocean. Rather than studying it, um, what he was seeing, he's turned his efforts to safeguarding the last wild places in the ocean. He leads expeditions around the world with a team of scientists, filmmakers, and policy experts to inspire the creation of marine protected areas which mitigate climate change, curb biodiversity loss, and increase seafood security. Here's a glimpse of their work. We are defined by the environments that we live in. It's our life. The ocean is our life. Miren hacia el mar y se miren las personas. Porque si no hay recursos, no hay vida. The big fish are gone. They have been fished out. As a global community, we need to decide what's the value of the ocean. There's a lot going on to raise awareness of these big oceanic problems. But the real trick is, what can we do about it? Conservation needs to be based on a sound understanding of how these ecosystems work, whether it's traditional knowledge or contemporary science. These remote camera systems give us a complete picture of the life in the waters. Si unimos, podemos hacer tal potencia que no la va a poder derribar nadie. I will work to declare Palau's waters closed to commercial fishing. To commit 40% of our exclusive economic zone. Y se constituye en un líder mundial en la conservación marina. We have an obligation as caretakers for the ocean. En los últimos años hemos avanzado como nunca en conservación marina. Falta muchísimo por proteger y tenemos que redoblar sus esfuerzos. we help preserve our environment. Seeing the planet as it used to be, see the ocean as it should be, and try to bring it back. So 26 marine reserves, altogether 2.5 million square miles, more than twice the size of India, with a goal to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. Just a few weeks ago, Pristine Seas embarked on an expedition to Colombia in partnership with the government and some local partners. They were invited to conduct the expedition as the government builds knowledge and support for a new MPA, the Eastern Tropical Pacific Marine Corridor. Another way we're advancing knowledge is by helping fill gaps in scientific data about our Earth's vital life support systems. And in the grand tradition of going farther, and dreaming bigger at Nat Geo, we started with the most extreme environment we could find. Few places on Earth inspire wonder and awe like Mount Everest. Two years ago, 
we embarked on a historic journey, the National Geographic and Rolex Perpetual Planet Everest Expedition, the most comprehensive single scientific expedition ever to Mount Everest. Explorer Baker Perry, who is here today, and explorer Tom Matthews, along with a team of international scientists, set out to better understand the effects of climate change in the Himalayas, which provide critical water resources to over a billion people. Among the highlights of the expedition, and there were many, the team installed the five weather stations at various elevations on the mountain, including the highest altitude weather station on Earth. They also collected the highest altitude ice core, taken at over 26,000 feet. Their feats garnered an inclusion in last year's Guinness Book of World Records. Here's a quick look at their journey. This is a different expedition than we ever had before. We're working where basically no other scientists work. This is the highest place in the world. The climate is changing. These glaciers are melting. It's very important to predict how fast it's going to happen and how it's going to influence human. Mount Everest is part of the Himalayas. We're here on a two-month expedition with National Geographic. Oh, it is coming. The largest scientific expedition ever conducted on Mount Everest. Scientists involved in this program came from glaciology, shifted shifted a little bit. A little bit yeah. here. geology, meteorology, panels in here. biology, and also from mapping. This is an important contribution to understanding how change is occurring and the implications of that change for the entire northern hemisphere. The ultimate goal of this project is to turn the science into something that has value for the people. I love that video, and especially that last line, turning science into something that's valuable for the people. And that's exactly what the team did. As a result of this expedition, we now have access to near real-time readings of weather data on Everest. And we not only share that data with communities and scientists, we also shared it with the world. We worked with our colleagues at the magazine to feature the expedition in the July 2020 issue, and we made a documentary of the expedition, which you can find on Disney+. Plus. You can also learn more about their journey and exhibition in our museum in DC, which, which just opened last month. As we thought about how to make the experience immersive for our guests, we knew we needed to take it to the next level, to really bring this to life with sound. And we're thrilled to partner with Spatial, an innovative, uh, innovator in immersive sound, to offer a 360 sensory experience with realistic soundscapes that make you feel like you are on the top of Everest, dodging a helicopter maybe, or standing next to a climber that's breathing very heavy. To get the full experience, you can join us this evening at Spatial's Around the World Party at the Sunset Room and I promise it's the closest that you'll get to Everest in Austin. In addition to the ocean and high mountains, we're committed to preserving pristine landscapes and wildlife. Paula Kahumba was recently named National Geographic's Explorer of the Year for her conservation efforts in Kenya. As the CEO of Wildlife Direct, she's devoted her career to protecting elephants from environmental change and poachers. Paula is an equally talented storyteller. She created and hosts Africa's first wildlife documentary series, Wildlife Warriors, to encourage people to see themselves as stakeholders in these efforts. Her work has motivated a new generation of Kenyans to see wildlife conservation as a career. She's also in production on a new uh, educational series, National Geographic Kids, filmed in Africa for and with African children. And she's also gearing up to be host of a new docu-series, Secrets of the Elephants, executive produced by our explorer at large, James Cameron, which will premiere on Disney Plus next year. Here's Paula. Elephants have this ability to look at you and you feel like you're being scanned from head to toe. My name is Paula Kahumbu, 
I'm a National Geographic explorer and I'm an elephant ecologist. In this area, the Maasai people believe that elephants actually are human beings. Every single day that I spend in the field, I am persuaded again and again. There couldn't be a more important job than to preserve nature and biodiversity. We're trying to raise a sense of national love for all the animals that live in these spectacular landscapes. National Geographic is supporting us to tell the stories from the front line that will inspire young people on this continent to not just love these animals, but want to act to save them. Explorer Steve Boys also works in Africa and leads National Geographic's Okavango Wilderness Project. It's an ambitious conservation initiative that aims to preserve the Okavango Delta, one of Africa's most important ecosystems. In 2015, the team of explorers, scientists, and storytellers made a grueling 1,500-mile journey to survey the river basin from its headwaters in Angola to its delta in Botswana. Here's Steve. Stretching hundreds of thousands of square miles across the heart of southern Africa, the Okavango River Basin releases trillions of liters of fresh water into the Kalahari Desert each year. Sustaining life for over a million people and supplying water to one of Africa's most enigmatic havens for wildlife, the Okavango Delta in Botswana. Since 2015, the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project has been exploring and documenting this vast intact ecosystem. We have paddled over 5,000 miles, scientifically surveying the source lakes and tributaries of these great rivers. During 23 expeditions, we have discovered 109 species believed to be new to science. Our camera traps have found new populations of endangered species like wild dog and cheetah, along with lion, leopard, hyena, roan antelope, and many other animals. These Angolan headwaters are under threat. Escalating deforestation, uncontrolled bushfires, commercial bushmeat trade, and unchecked rural development put the future of this incredibly important ecosystem at risk. We've demonstrated the importance of this incredible landscape. Now we have to protect it. Our goal is to expand one of the largest transboundary wildlife corridors in Sub-Saharan Africa spanning the four nations that share the Okavango and Kwando River basins. Guided by local communities, we aim to establish a system of new protected areas in the Angolan Highlands. We will work with the local communities to create a conservation-based economy. We will create and support ways these people can live off this incredible landscape. We don't have much time to save Earth's last unprotected wild places. We are deeply committed to securing permanent, sustainable protection for the sources in Angola and the Greater Okavango River Basin. With protection, this landscape and its people will continue to thrive. This region will set an example for the world. Now is the time to act. Now is the time to protect this place. Their journey was chronicled in the film Into the Okavango, which raised awareness about the biodiverse region and established important partnerships to protect it. After the, after the film premiered in Angola, the Society formalized a four-year partnership with the Angolan government to protect the river basin. Into the Okavanga is also available on Disney Plus, and I highly recommend it. Our media partnership with Disney enables to amplify our explorers and their work to millions more people. In fact, the Disney Plus platform now has more than 100 million subscribers worldwide. Our explorers also include young people on the front lines of the most complex and ur urgent issues of our time. Our young explorers are change makers, ages 16 to 25, 
or tackling issues from climate crisis to human wildlife conflict. Their focus is on driving progress and sustainable solutions for our planet. To date, we've funded 75 uh, young explorers from nearly 30 countries. One of our young explorers is Kahekesha Basu, co-founder of the Green Hope Foundation, which uses a, work, a networking platform to help young people around the world implement the UN Sustainable Development Goals through grassroots action. Kahekesha is the youngest ever global coordinator for the UN Environmental Program for Children and Youth, a UN human rights champion, and a, human, a climate reality leader, just to name a few things. Her efforts shine a light on the difference one person can make and also make you wonder what the heck you were doing when you were 20. <laughs> when we think of our explorers, we often think of our intrepid mountain climbers or marine biologists who swim with the sharks. And while we fund many of those bold scientists, we put equal value on our masterful storytellers and innovative educators. I've spent the majority of my career in higher ed and learned that sometimes science alone is not enough to inspire change we want to see in the world. So, while we ground our work in rigorous science, we combine it with compelling storytelling to cultivate understanding and touch hearts and minds to invoke positive change. We often say that science is our, is our foundation and storytelling is our superpower. Photographer Anand Varma is a great example of an explorer who fuses science and storytelling. Several years, years ago, he pitched a story to the magazine about hummingbirds. As the story goes, the editors told him, that's boring, every photo of a hummingbird that can be taken has been taken. But Anand is nothing if not tenacious, and it shows in his work. His Im image documents the maj majesty of the world's miniature creatures, from hummingbirds to bees to zombie parasites. Take a look. Now the work that I'm most proud of is the result of a 10 year long collaboration with a scientist who studies hummingbirds. This is a story on what we have learned about hummingbirds thanks to modern science. The most fun I had working on this project was getting to point a high speed camera at hummingbirds to show these discoveries in a new way. We are in the lab of Chris Clark at UC Riverside, and what we've got here is a cage that's recreating an experiment, and it's trying to look at how hummingbirds deal with rain, and we're using this fancy top-of-the-line Phantom Flex 4K high-speed camera to try to film this hummingbird at 1,000 frames a second to see how it's going to deal with this, all these rain droplets and what it's going to do to dry itself off. And it is that sense of wonder and that joy of discovery that drew me to photography, and it is those feelings I hope to spark in other people. It's one of my favorite videos, it's mesmerizing. Explorer Joel Sartori is a photographer with a similar labor of love. Fifteen years ago, he had an amazing idea to create an arc of animal photos. In the face of global biodiversity loss and the sixth mass extinction, Joel hopes his portraits will encourage people to care and to act to save these animals before they're gone forever. His ultimate goal is to take images of the 20,000 plus species in human care in zoos, aquariums, and wildlife sanctuaries. So far, he's taken over 12,000. This is a snapshot of some of them. Joel's from Nebraska with a strong Midwestern work ethic, one that I appreciate having grown up in Iowa. Recently, I joined him for a shoot and watched him behind the scenes. 
It's clear that getting that perfect shot is hard work. Take a look. Can you believe that he's done that more than 12,000 times? <laughs> Explorer and photographer Carlton Ward is a remarkable example of how illumination can lead to protection. For the better part of a decade, he worked to establish the Florida Wildlife Corridor, a sweeping natural area that would protect the, wild, the state's habitat and wildlife, including the elusive Florida panther. Through a combination of photography and videos, combined with coverage in National Geographic magazine, Carlton was able to effectively engage lawmakers and the public about the area's heritage and natural wonders. This image, taken by Carlton, appeared in the April 2021 issue of the magazine, as did this map of the corridor. Two months after the magazine was published, Florida lawmakers passed the act to provide $400 million to protect green spaces and wildlife. What's really amazing is that it passed with unanimous bipartisan support. And the law went into effect last July, and it was really wonderful to see Carlton's dream come true. Our explorers also tell stories about our human journey. Tara Roberts joined a team of black scuba divers and historians on a search for shipwrecks that carried enslaved Africans to the Americas during the transatlantic slave trade. Tara takes great care to document this difficult subject while still centering the ingenuity and humanity of the individuals at the heart of her stories. Tara's journey is featured in a new podcast, Into the Depths. It's amazing to see the buzz it's getting. So far, the podcast has been downloaded some 250,000 times. She was on the cover story of our March issue of the magazine, featured on a billboard in Times Square, and interviewed on GMA, Nightline, NPR, and others. Here's the trailer for her podcast, which helped build excitement before it dropped in January. Black scuba divers are searching for shipwrecks from the transatlantic slave trade. It was like diving on a grave site. And honoring the 1.8 million Africans who were lost. I'm National Geographic explorer Tara Roberts, and I dropped everything to travel with these divers. Come to Costa Rica! Join me for Into the Depths, a six-part Nat Geo podcast series starting in January. It's going to be an incredible journey. National Geographic has always been grounded in trustworthy, evidence-based journalism. During the pandemic, this became vitally important, life-saving even. People turn to the news for find information about transmission, symptoms, testing sites, grocery stores, inventory, and everything in between. As one of the largest funders of individual journalists in the world, the society immediately recognized a need and launched the, launched the COVID-19 Emergency Fund for Journalists. This map represents the more than 150 grant recipients we funded from over 50 countries. And these are some of the powerful images. The photo on the upper right is particularly haunting. Photographer Joshua Irwandi 
was shadowing hospital workers in Indonesia when he captured this image of a COVID-19 victim's body wrapped in plastic. The photo circulated around the world and brought home the devastating human cost of the pandemic. For this image, Joshua was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Another way we illuminate the wonder of the world is through education, which plays a fundamental role in our mission work. We equip educators with resources and professional learning opportunities, and then educators in turn create transformative experiences which help millions of young people learn about our world. In the first year of the pandemic, more than 34 million people worldwide used our virtual resource library. Plus, what would NetGeo be without maps? We've been publishing them for over a century, and maps remain central to our mission today. And I don't know if you heard, but last summer, National Geographic officially recognized the world's fifth ocean, the Southern Ocean. It's the body of water that surrounds Antarctica. The story made headlines around the world, as well as a few cameos on the late night comedy circuit, like Trevor Noah, Jimmy Fallon, and of course, Stephen Colbert. Take a look. It was really difficult to pick which explorers to show you today because we have so many doing amazing work. I could probably, and I could also spend hours telling you about our education resources, our museum exhibitions, and our events at our headquarters. Our new strategy is to double down on what we do best from big, impactful, explorer-led programs like I showed you today to a $200 million renovation of our museum and public spaces, which will begin this summer. At National Geographic, we engage people with our mission because we're a trusted brand. Since that very first meeting in 1888, we've remained relevant because people know when they come to National Geographic, they can trust what they're seeing, reading, and experiencing, whether it's a film, photograph, article, or map. Also being a nonpartisan nonprofit opens doors and transcends geographical and political barriers, so important given today's polarization. But we're also bound by something else, a shared passion to make a difference. One of my favorite quotes comes from one of our National Geographic legends, the great oceanographer and explorer at large, Sylvia Earle. She said, hold, hold up a mirror and ask yourself what you're capable of doing and what you really care about. Then take the initiative. Don't wait for someone else to ask you to act. At National Geographic, achieving our audacious mi mission hinges on all of us working together. Passionate individuals, champions of the natural world, innovators, educators, entrepreneurs, and storytellers. People like you. So join us in whatever way that works best for you. It could be something as simple as listening to Tara's podcast or mentoring the young people in your community to ignite their spirit of exploration or picking up a camera to capture and share the stories of our time, supporting one of our Explorer programs, or applying for a grant to become a National Geographic Explorer yourself. And as you can see, shark onesies are always welcome. <laughs> there are many ways to be a part of the National Geographic global community. Visit natgeo.org to find the way that resonates with you. We share this planet, and shared challenges demand shared solutions. So the next time someone asks you about National Geographic, I hope that the story you think of is not just the magazine, but also the mission. Cutting edge science, intrepid exploration, transformative education, and masterful storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of the work we're doing at National Geographic. And now I'm pleased to dive into a Q&A, but before I do that, I'd like to welcome one of these great explorers to the stage with me. Explorer Baker Perry is here with us, and I'd like to invite him up on the stage so you could ask him some direct questions about that expedition to Everest. A quick, <laughs> a quick bio, Baker's a researcher who studies snow, ice, and the climate as a professor at Appalachian State University. He teaches geography and climate change, and he's also an accomplished mountain climber. He was able to merge all of those skills when he enjoyed our National Geographic and World X Perpetual Planet X Everest Expedition. That's a mouthful. Baker, welcome. <laughs> 
Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, Jill, part of the National Geographic team. And I was as inspired, I think, as everyone else was in, in hearing and seeing the other stories from the explorers. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Great. So we had, we'd love some um, questions, but I thought I'd start us off. And why don't you tell us a little bit about what it's like to do science at 26,000 feet? That's a great question. And it's hard enough just to stay alive at 26,000 feet. I mean, it takes hours to melt snow, to cook, and that's even um, inside the tent and trying to keep the stove going. I won't even talk about using the bathroom at 26,000 feet underneath you know, our, our down suits and everything else. And there's not a lot of oxygen up there, so we're using supplemental oxygen. And even with that, our brains are a little hazy and don't work very well. And it's incredibly cold. It's uh, below zero even during the daytime. The wind chills are, are negative 40 or below. And, and so just, just surviving is a big challenge. And then to do science on top of that was a, a huge challenge on this expedition in, in 2019. And I think one of the, one of the ways that, reasons that we were successful is that we had an incredibly strong team, especially these elite climbing Sherpa that carried the bulk of the loads and had worked with us in preparation uh, on, the, on the front end of the expedition to learn how to set up and, and operate the, the weather stations that we installed to operate the drills for the ice cores. And so we had a very strong team and so that was a secret to our success as well. Great, thank you. Any questions for Baker? So in, in the ice core, which is the highest ice core in the world that's ever been obtained at over 26,000 feet, we brought the ice down and then shipped it to the lab at the University of Maine where our colleagues there are doing the analysis. So and, and that, just the logistics of doing that, just getting the ice down from 26,000 feet to base camp is a, is a huge ordeal, let alone getting it back to the United States in a lab at the University of Maine and you know, still, still as ice. Uh, those, are, those are big, big challenges. And the analysis is still ongoing on that. Baker, why don't you tell us a little bit about your next expedition in, in the Amazon? Right, so later this summer, at the end of um, July, we're planning an expedition to Asongate, which is uh, one of the high peaks in southern Peru. And it's an incredibly important water tower that um, sustains those high elevation communities downstream. And it also is a very important um, headwater of the Amazon. And so we're gonna be uh, trying to understand the processes driving the climate changes on the highest elevations there, the Andes, and looking at the linkages uh, with the Amazon as well and following that drop of water as it moves downstream through the Amazon basin. Exciting. Um, also, I was wondering, how do you prepare for all this climbing? <clears throat> it's a it's a big challenge. I mean, this the logistics of uh, going on these expeditions and the planning involved with that is uh, is a, a really a major challenge in and of itself. Then there are the physical preparations, and uh, so what that looks like going um, planning for an Everest expedition is uh, 15 to 20 hours a week of lots of volume going up and down mountains, uh, you know, spend time on the Stairmaster. It really depends on, on where I am and there's a lot of physical preparation. And then of course there's the, there's the engineering of building and designing these weather stations and testing those and, um, and making sure these sensors are gonna work when we get into these extreme environments is a, is a huge challenge as well. Yes, did I see it? Yeah. So how does it work? How does it work the relations and the preparations within the local community? How do you bring and value them? Because you're basically there to discover stuff that, but people live there. So how do you care and connect and build this bridge with the local, local communities? Well, speaking specifically to the Everest expedition in 2019, there were some of our, the core members of our team went oh, about three months ahead of the expedition and spent a month in the Kumbu of, of Nepal and working closely with our Sherpa team members based out of their community, building those relationships and testing out key components of the 
of the weather stations and the tripods that we were going to install. And so that was, that was important to go and establish those relationships. In the case of the Peru ex expedition that's coming up later this year, I've been working in, in these communities and with many of these um, same um, local collaborators that are going to be part of the expedition over the past 10 to 15 years. And I'm very fortunate to have long-standing relationships with the local university, the community, and, and, and other key partners. And so, so we you know, will be working closely with them over the next few months to, to prepare for this expedition and, and really fully brief the, the surrounding communities and, and really involve them. And in fact, we've, we've involved citizen scientists in, in, in taking daily precipitation measurements and, um, and collecting samples, for example, for the, the isotope analysis of, of the rainfall that's been occurring. And so they've, we've, we've involved them in, in the science. And I think that's part of the story. And I know that National Geographic has done a great job of involving citizen scientists and other programs around the world as well. I, I had a general question, if that's OK. It's about um, exploring of under. Of course. Oh, th thanks. Um, it's about exploring under fire and how National Geographic does partnerships. So, so what I mean by exploring under fire is there's a, been a lot of countries recently, Afghanistan, Syria, that have faced war now, the, you know, now Ukraine. Um, even some of my friends like who are like Fulbright scholars would go to a, a place in Africa like Timbuktu and then explore manuscripts that after they leave get destroyed by ISIL or something like that. Um, how within the scope of National Geographic is it to prioritize kind of like heritage at risk? And then secondarily, I'm occasional faculty at U Chicago, a couple other a couple other places. Um, how do institutions that would be interested in like recruiting explorers or partnering in some way um, access National Geographic in that way? Yeah, that's thank you for that question. It is it's very important now, um, of course. And we um, National Geographic, one of our main focus areas is human history and cultures, and some of that is the work that's like Tara's doing that I profiled today, um, but also that of of you know cultural preservation. We we just have a new partnership that we signed um, in Paris a few months ago with the Alif Foundation, and their um, goal specifically is to preserve um, antiquities and other um, cultural heritage in war zones, right? And they're also starting, we also have a new uh, program at National Geographic. We're funding some explorers to do that work around climate change. Um, we're also seeing, for example, some of these um, sites that are being damaged by the change in climate as well. Um, and, and to the question earlier, trying to do that in a way that's very engaged with local communities in these um, countries and around these sites. Um, and so uh, that'll be a big focus for us going forward as UNESCO is about to celebrate an anniversary. We're doing some work with them as well um, for that. And then in terms of partnerships, um, one of the biggest ways we partner is through our explorers. So um, many of our explorers are university professors, um, like Baker is. and and they bring us those partnerships through their institutions. Um, we also have loved to get our explorers onto college campuses, not only to share the work we're doing, but also to recruit um, the talent at places like Chicago. So we would you know, love to make a connection there and figure out ways that we can um, partner with faculty, graduate students, and undergrads on campuses as well. Uh, so just wanted to start off by saying thank you so much for this presentation. It was great to see all those videos as well as uh, just hear a bit more about National Geographic. Um, my question is specifically about science communication. Uh, it seems like the Everest project was a great example of being able to do this science, do it rigorously, but then also communicate that information to the public. I'm curious about, um, uh, Peter, on your ex uh, experience with this, is there any surprising advice that you've learned throughout the process of communicating the science? Was there anything that you were like, oh wow, this was like really shocking and changed the way that you think about how you approach science communication? Well, I can tell a story, I think, to start off. I mean, I really before the 2019 expedition, I didn't have a lot of experience working with media teams or really doing the storytelling. I mean, I was I was pretty involved in, in the science. And so, and, and actually two other key members from our team, the three of us decided the first day to just run from the media team. Like we, we, we had work we wanted to do. We didn't know these people and just, I mean, they wanted us to do all these extra things. And so I think for me, over the past few years, I've learned to, uh, be more patient and really recognize the incredible value that the that the that the the media that the photography and the videos bring 
and, and enable us to tell these stories. And so for me, that, that's a huge um, benefit of, of this partnership with, with National Geographic. And, you know, I think the, another take-home point is that what may seem particularly exciting to those of us on the, on the science side from the scientists may not be the most compelling in some cases or um, that the media or even the general public. And so, so developing those relationships and having communication from um, conversations with, with the journalists in, in particular and, and folks on the media team has been really, really enlightening for me in terms of understanding the opportunities around specific issues. So th those are a couple of examples. And, and I would just add that one of the things we do at National Geographic is a lot of training, science telling and um, training for our explorers. And in our new um, strategic plan, all of our scientists and explorers will have that kind of training. So not only not necessarily make you do the best videos in photography, but helping people with media training and also how to find those those core stories that really resonate with the public um, and you know help people also be able to to tell things in a way that other everyone can understand. We really do believe that sort of science foundation storytelling superpower. It's sort of a special um, special place for National Geographic to have impact. Magazine. There were multiple um, specials on National Geographic on the channel. Podcast had had episodes of Overheard. Um, how does that pipeline work? Does does the network ever feed that to you and say we're looking for more content on Everest, or is it we happen to have three things going on about Everest and then they make a big event out of it? Um, and are there opportunities like that for the Peru? And, and how does that affect you as an explorer? So I'll start, and then you can. Um, so you know, the, the on the TV side, the, the the streaming side, it takes a long time. Um, and so what we really try to do is plan more. And I'm glad you're seeing that because that is something we're really trying to do to have that impact across platforms. Um, so often these are two or three years in the making. Um, I mentioned a couple. Uh, Tara's podcast is another one that we really worked on for a long time. I don't know if any of you saw Secrets of the Whales with Brian Scarry on Disney Plus last year. We did a big um, multi-platform, and that was the society funding more than three years of Brian's work before we got to that point. The Secrets of the Elephants, which Paula will do, will do a similar kind of big launch around. Um, and it really does help to kind of create that that moment um, and where people really talk about it. And that's where we feel we can really have some impact on bringing people along with the mission. But I don't know how it, it, it impacted the expedition. You know, specific to Everest, I mean, it, it was an expedition that came together fairly quickly. And, and so we were adding, for example, media team members uh, really up until a few weeks before the expedition. And so, I think the, fin the end product was, was unbelievable. Uh, if, if you've had a chance to see the, the TV special and some of the impact media, and we, and we saw one of the, the, the sizzle reels today. Um, but, you know, it's, it can be a challenge on expeditions, just adding new people and, and fitting people in. And, and, and so in the field, it's not easy to, to pull these things off. And, and so I think that's where, for me, having participated in the Everest expedition, I have a much better understanding of the logistics. It's not just the science that we're going there to do, but there, I mean, there's the adventure element, there's uh, exploration, of course, and, and then the, the, the storytelling and then the education that comes out of that is just so important. And, and it's, you know, there are so many moving parts in that. And, and so from, as an explorer, I have a much better appreciation for what goes into that now after being you know, part of this Everest expedition, I think in the, in the future can, can, um, can help plan a little bit better with that as well. And the Peru expedition that Baker was talking about also will have a big Explorer TV component as well, and that's already underway as well as being covered in the magazine. So, thank you. Yes, in the back. Jill, my question is for you. So first of all, fellow Iowa native and escapee in the room. <laughs> uh, so as a woman leader, there are many of us in the room that probably aspire 
to be at your level. How have you used your authenticity as a leader to get to where you are? Thanks for that question. The so I am the first woman to sit in this chair, um, and it um, it was I think an important transformation at the society. I you know I b believe that representation matters a lot. Um, so it also puts a lot of responsibility um, on you I, as well, and I take that seriously, uh, for sure. Um, you know I think I think the authenticity. Um, it's sort of how I've always led. Maybe it's that Midwestern Iowa girl. Um, background. Um, but throughout my career, whether it was in higher ed, um, being a college president, or getting to this role, um, I think being part, I have sort of a servant leadership kind of model, which worked really well in higher ed, and actually works really well in National Geographic, because it's our, the best, we're at our best when we're lifting up our talent, right? Because they are amazing in what they do. Um, so I think approaching that from, um, you know, not, not being scared to be out front and recognizing that there is a lot of responsibility that goes with the role as the first woman, but also feeling really great about putting others ahead of you and working on making sure that those people are also um, representative. We worked really hard, as I mentioned before, to have parity in our grants now at National Geographic. We are now doing, um, we're really trying to mitigate the amount of parachute science that we're doing or exploration, as Baker talked about, engaging communities. More than 60% of our explorers are now in their home um, regions doing work rather than a sort of traditional um, North American kind of exploration. So we're very pleased about that. Working really hard on BIPOC representation in the U.S., the kind of stories. One of our explorers told me one time, if you want to change the story, Jill, you have to change the storyteller. Um, and that's um, something. So trying to, you know, recognize my representation mattering and how important that is as we send these explorers out to schools and college campuses and the media around the world, uh, we really think we can make a difference there. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been great to be with you today. We appreciate it. Thank you.